practice stewardship better. So when I read a book called Starbucks Experience, it was the history of Starbucks and how they try to market themselves, how they try to operate their business, my mind began to think, okay, uh, if they're trying to touch all five senses, how can I do that? And I keep wrestling with that issue. How could we take stewardship into our churches? And since we live in an emotional culture, a culture of experience, how can we touch people with all five senses? And I've still got some work to do on it. That's why I call this uh, presentation Stewardship of Starbucks Experience. It's an ongoing study and uh, uh, we'll just kind of keep rolling. So I've taken the principles of Starbucks and tried to apply them to how we can raise the level of stewardship uh, in our church and, and district. There'll be four video clips and I want to start out with this one. Yo, I'm Vanilla Latte, and this is the tall, frothy one, and this is the Starbucks wrap. Starbucks. I want to talk about Starbucks just for a moment or two, and then I'm going to switch to some things that take place in our culture, and I want to then move into the presentation. You have home. That is a nice place. You have work that you go to. So there's place number one, place number two. Starbucks wants to be the third place that you go. But they have competition. The mall wants to be your third place. It is a yuppie puppy coffee cuppy cafe, as some people have called it. When I'd read this book, I thought, I would like to go to the original Starbucks to see how it felt and if they really tried to touch all five senses. I'm not a hot drink type of person, so I don't drink Starbucks, and I just can't bear paying the price uh, of, uh, of, of that anyway. 
So I'm out in the West Coast in Seattle, and I go to the original Starbucks, but there were so many people, tourists, that you could not get in the door. And I thought, well, there's no way I'm going to experience any kind of feeling whatsoever there. So my friend, he takes me down two or three blocks, and we find another Starbucks, and we sit in there, and I must say, I don't know as I felt anything touch all five senses. It just seemed like a comfortable place, or maybe it was doing its job more than I realized. But they do touch, they do try to touch all five senses. 20,891 stores, 62 countries. They sell books, they sell music. Listen to this. It takes 140 liters of water to grow one cup of coffee. 50 cups of water to produce a teaspoonful of sugar. So uh, we use a lot of natural resources to produce that. It is all about the relationship of that experience. They work hard to make sure you have a good experience. They have 10 million Facebook fans. However, McDonald's has more loyal customers than Starbucks. And they believe that people drinking McDonald's coffee, it's more people drinking that than people drinking Starbucks <laughs> coffee. If you are an employee of this company, you must meet the following principles. You've got to be welcoming, you've got to be genuine, considerate, knowledgeable, and involved. So those are very good principles that uh, this company uses. Just think about those principles in a church. Be welcoming, be genuine, be considerate, be knowledgeable, and be involved. All of those would apply. And if Starbucks can do it, we have a much more powerful and wonderful product than a drink. But it is amazing how you have a city named Las Vegas that makes something bad for you look so exciting and good. And how, how religious organizations and churches have something so good, but we kind of make it look boring or bad or uninteresting. Or we give it a bad name because of the shenanigans Members do and leaders do. And it's because the devil just hates that church. He just hates it. So, much for Starbucks. Let me give you just a little bit of an idea about the culture that we live in. We toss 140 million cell phones away per year. We toss out roughly 112,000 computers per day. We use one million brown paper bags each hour. We use one million plastic cups on planes every six hours. We use two million plastic bottles every five minutes. There's a collection of plastic that floats in the Pacific Ocean that is the size of Texas. And there's one in the Atlantic Ocean that's not quite as large. Plastic has now become a permanent part of the ocean. No matter if we spent mega millions to clean it up, we will never get rid of all the plastic in the ocean. As far as our culture is concerned, <clears throat> foreign investors hold slightly less than 50% of all publicly held and publicly traded U.S. securities, 25% of corporate bonds, and 12% of U.S. corporate bonds. 47% of American homes have guns. We spend $48 billion a year on pets. We have drugs to fight depression, doggy slippers, $500 Chanel pearls for nights out, $270 Ferrari bed, nose jobs. Can you believe a nose job for a dog? Some of those dogs, they didn't turn out too well, did they? You know, the dogs that have the nose pushed in, what is that, a bulldog? Or, or? 
uh, braces, tummy tucks, facelifts, counseling for dogs? How does that work? I've imagined trying to get anything out of a dog. All, they, all our dog does is look at you. <clears throat> On average, we are a materialistic lot. Americans love our stuff, but more stuff does not make us happy. So we act as if we prefer money over people from the world of psychology. If you were to play Monopoly with play money, the more money that you have will make you less helpful to the person that is losing at the game of Monopoly because it's designed that way. You play that game of Monopoly, you will see all sorts of emotions come out in the players in the course of that game. It'll make sometimes enemies out of the best of friends. <laughs> money is like fire. It's an element that has little trouble moralizing the earth, moralizing the air and water. Men can employ it as a tool or they can dance around it as if, they were, as, if, as if it were an incarnation of a god. Money votes socialist, it votes monarchist, it finds profit in pornography, it finds profit in translating the Bible. It commissions Rembrandt. It underwrites the technology of Auschwitz. It acquires its meaning from the uses to which it is put. If that's what money can do, why can't we put money to work for a cause that has eternal influence, eternal impact? Now listen to this. This is amazing stuff. We're a materialistic lot. You're a materialist. I am a materialist. I fight against it. You and I, we fight against it. It's just the culture. The culture is too powerful for us. Thank God for the love of Jesus and what he has done for us and to give us ourselves a fighting chance. The Christian world is saying, let's promote. If you tie, that's fine, but it's not required. But let's promote offerings and let's appeal to get the members money by saying this offering is going to generate something for you. So they try to get, uh, they appeal that they promote tithe and offering that appeals to the self-interest of the members. Have you ever thought of asking for an offering appeal and do it in such a way that the person sitting there says, oh, what's in it for me? That's what the Christian world likes. That's why they have these mega churches. What's in it for me? Razzle dazzle shows. They got the music. They've got interpretive dance and they've got skits and things I don't understand. Glitz, the best preaching money can buy these these men and women are just absolutely brilliant. It's all calculated. But I want to ask you the question, does tithe and offering have much meaning to people sitting in the pew? When I give tithe and offering, is there any meaning? Or do I do it just by robot, robotic fashion? Does it give me a bang for my buck? I had a guy call me up, he said, John, can't you get me a good preacher at my church? This guy can't preach worth two cents. He said, I'm paying for it. Can't I get any better bang for my buck? Well, I don't have any responsibility or influence on placing pastors. And uh, all I could do is talk with him. I happen to know him and I happen to know the pastor. And uh, I do think preachers ought to give a bang for the buck. Preachers ought to preach their heart out. And I know many preachers do. But I know many preachers, I've sat and listened to them 
They read the script. I had an intern one time. I assigned him an evan- I assigned him an evangelistic series, and he preached the Antichrist in 30 minutes. And afterwards, I went up to him and said, "How did you do that? I need to learn how to do that. I never could get through that topic in an hour." Uh, it's a complicated topic, and uh, but it is a, an appropriate question to ask ourselves: What does tithe and offering mean to me? Am I getting a bang for my buck? Uh, in society, as societies become wealthier, they experience an increase in mental health disorders. Of all the nations in the world, the United States is at the top of the heap when it comes to mental suffering. And and our churches are not immune from this. Because we're beaten down all week long, we work hard, we crash on Friday night, we drag ourselves to church, and, and there's mental suffering going on. And then this guy is mumbling up there, or woman's mumbling, and, and uh, or, or listen to this. This also comes from Roberts. Materialists were less satisfied with their family, their friends, their self-perception, where they live, their health, the amount of fun and enjoyment they experienced, the money they made, and their jobs. Sixty-five percent of Americans own their home. Success for middle class nowadays is not home ownership, but to have a secure job. People who are more materialistic commonly report higher levels of anxiety and depression. Is it possible that returning tithe and offering could help anxiety and depression? The research says yes. When you give, you are happier. But people can't connect it. They don't understand it. The emotions have overwhelmed them and sometimes they can't feel it. They can't sense it. They just say, well, I'm just giving that. I don't get any bang for my buck because the sermon... Now, I realize that you should not come to church to get. You need to come to church to give. There's a big difference in that attitude. And uh, you will get a whole lot more if you come to church to give than if you come to church and expect to get something. Um, I remember one time, my very first church, I was shaking hands and a lady said, I'm not coming back to church. I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Do you mind if I stop by and see you sometime? She said, sure. So I went by to see her, and I said, well, why aren't you going to come back to church? She says, you don't shake hands hard enough. Uh, I was so surprised, I just didn't continue the conversation. I didn't know how to answer that. But I have started cranking down on handshakes ever since then. (laughs) Teens and young adults today are five to eight times more likely to report being depressed or suffering other mental health problems as compared to their counterparts in 1938. If I buy a guitar, or if you buy an automobile, if you buy a product, oh, I've dreamed of that, I want it, I've got to have it. You buy an electric blanket, that seems like it'd be appropriate after walking out in the cold, you know, feels pretty good. How long will I enjoy that item that I have bought before I want something else? And the answer is that you'll enjoy it three months and then you're gonna want something else. That's a characteristic of a materialist. In psychology, that is called adaptation. So if you have a job that you think is your dream job, 
chances are you'll enjoy it three months and then the honeymoon is gone. And, it's, and you've got to really like what you're doing to keep after it. If you make forty to $60,000 a year, after that, your happiness begins to taper off. If I were to come give you $100,000 free and clear, it would increase your happiness by only 3%. And you say, come on, John, give me a chance. <laughs> Your happiness will be greater with less TV. But the TV is watched almost eight hours a day. That's like a full-time job. So no wonder people are coming to church stressed out, not only from work, but what they see on television, and just think about it. Are those people on those programs really planning for heaven? So why am I watching it? And I do sometimes, and I try not to watch it late at night because if I do, I'm awake all night. My wife is the same way. You will be happier well, I think the research would, in, would almost prove that you would be happier if you didn't have a television. Now, I'm not knocking television. That instrument can be used to the glory of God in many, many ways. But it's also a tool of Satan. So let's take a look at the five principles that we might be able to apply to stewardship or to the tithe and offering experience. Number one, living in this crazy culture. When people come, we've got to get people to own this concept. And that is one of the areas that the younger generation is coming on. They, they love the church, they give, but they do not own the tithe and offering system like the greatest generation the baby boomers own it just a little bit less, but they're still loyal. Uh, what's amazing, boomers give 90% of what is given to charity. 90%. They're retiring at seven to 10,000 per day. And that's why I say in our own persuasion, we got about 15 years before we really see what's happening with uh, the finances of our church. <clears throat> so how do I own it? A, I've got to value it. We tend to give to what we value. When I go to church, does it have value for me? Do I value my church? The more value a church member has to your local congregation, the more likely they will contribute to it. Do I understand it? Do I believe the unique teachings of the Adventist church? Do I own it? Uh, there's a guy, Dr. McIver, he's an Adventist professor at Avondale College in Australia. He did a major piece of research just completing it. And uh, I had him give a, a brief presentation the other day and uh, he made an interesting observation from his research. There are lifestyle issues that are unique to Adventist, like health certain kinds of food, uh, spirit of prophecy. Uh, so there's unique aspects of, of Adventism. And in his research, tithing is part of those lifestyle issues. But if we live in a postmodern culture where anything goes, you know, there are people that don't accept Ellen White anymore. There are people that don't accept uh, uh, the culture or the belief of certain type of, of uh, Sabbath keeping. Uh, we can't expect people to say, well, I'm going to buy into the system when they don't consider it as part of their identity. So returning tithe and offering is part of the lifestyle identity of Seventh-day Adventist. Do we believe the mission? Do we understand it? Do we commit to it? Do we practice it? 
And then a little bit later on, I'll talk about a missional budget, and I alluded to that uh, uh, yesterday. Philippians 2, verse 12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, Ruth 1.16. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. She was owning the faith of her mother-in-law. Here, Paul is saying to the Philippians, You've got to own it. You've got to work out your own salvation. And I think what he's meaning here, working out your own salvation, is practical sanctification. How does all of this apply to my everyday living? Uh, Charles Spurgeon, a, uh, what was he, a Senate chaplain, a famous preacher, look on the internet at some of his stewardship sermons. Wow! They are impressive. You want to a sermon that you can preach? I mean, he knew how to preach. Here's what he said. You may be sound in the head. You may be sound in the faith. But it is greater to be sound in the heart. Well, let me put a 21st century spin on it. You know, along with Martin Luther. Conversion of heart, mind, and purse. Here he's got the head, the intellect, he's got the faith, but we live in the world of our emotions, and that's the heart. 1970s and the early 80s was the apogee of spiritual individualism. From human potential, move, a human potential movement, free to be you and me mentality, and the whole new age panoply. What is apogee? That, was, that is the culmination, the greatest point. The 1970s and 80s, that's the greatest point of individualism. And it hasn't gone away. It continues. Uh, individualistic pluralism is the foundation. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you a new phrase of a bobo spiritual life. Why are we having so much trouble getting our members to own not only stewardship, but own other lifestyle things that, are, that make up our message? How do we, why is it so hard? David Brooks writes in a book, <clears throat> At heart is spirituality without obligation. That is at the heart of the thinking of the young people today. That is also the heart of the New Age movement. To have spirituality without obligation. And I mentioned the other day, the way this shows up in our churches is when people church hop. They want spirituality, they want the big show, but they don't want the obligation of their local congregation. They don't own it. They haven't bought into it. That's one way postmodern culture and the New Age movement, movement has affected the religious world and our own persuasion. I uh, pastored churches on the Florida Gulf Coast. I never knew who was going to be at church. It was almost a different crowd every day, every week. Because the local members, they want a break. They go to the beach. The tourists, they've gone to the beach. They come to church for a couple of hours, and then they're gone again. But I guarantee you, there is a philosophy that we have not been able to articulate, and people do not realize it. We want spirituality, but we don't want any obligation. And if we want people to be faithful to the Adventist message, and faithful in tithe and offering, we've got to get them obligated, and you won't get them obligated unless you get them there at church. They, this is kind of a no-brainer. The more people attend church, the more likely they are to give. If you get them involved, they're more likely to give. Did you know that many years ago, Del Delker, some of you old-timers, you remember her? She was singing for the Voice of Prophecy 
before she ever became a Seventh-day Adventist. We get people involved. But if we have a real small umbrella where we can't hardly get under it as, a con as congregations, uh, we become too homogeneous. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that doesn't mean that we've got to have such a huge umbrella that we just don't have any standards whatsoever. Uh, a big umbrella means there's always room at the cross Amen. for okay. people to come to. Let him grab a hold of them. It's our task to present that in a gripping fashion, a gripping manner. The system, listen to what Ellen White says, the system of tithes and offerings was intended to impress the minds of men with a great truth, that God is the source of every blessing to his creatures and that to him man's gratitude is due for the good gifts of his providence. If we could somehow convey that to congregations in practical terms, I think we would see an effect. That's the bang for the buck when people give. It is to impress on the minds of those people that give that God is the source of every blessing. But how many times have I just boom, boom, I put it in the offering plate, I don't even think about it. Since I've been doing stewardship, I've tried to make my own giving more of a spiritual experience. Um, every man, woman, and child may become a treasurer for the Lord. So some of you are treasures. But when I return tithe and offering, I am a treasurer for the Lord. There's another interesting concept to see if we can... Uh, project. Councils on Stewardship, the New Testament does not reenact the law of tithe. I've mentioned this. This is the reference. Councils on Stewardship 66. When somebody comes to you and say, tithe is not mentioned in the New Testament, therefore we don't have to do it. I had an Adventist preacher tell me this. He was a young guy, a young preacher. And this is the answer. And he still didn't believe it. So the issue with him is not tithe. There's a bigger issue. He's got a prophet that he needs to deal with. And I bet if you studied and talked with him, there would be some other issues that are there. But this is what she says. The New Testament does not reenact the law of the tithe as it does not that of the Sabbath. For the validity of both is assumed and their deep spiritual import explained. While we as a people are seeking faithfully to give to God the time which he has reserved as his own, shall we not also render to him that portion of our means which he claims? So our giving. Only giving creates human dignity. Only giving opens up the soul. Only giving can miraculously change a life. Only givers get. And we live in a culture that is against giving, yet America is the most generous nation on earth. Mm -hmm. And you have people saying, we've all fallen off the wagon. We don't give to our capacity and our potential. Only giving works at the soul level and radiates outward to every era of your experience, area of your experience. Only givers live a truly fulfilled, powerful, positive, happy, and deep, meaningful life. Giving is practicing what Jesus set as an example. He was a gift. He healed entire cities. How would you like to have... Well, I, I've often thought when I would visit the sick in the hospital, what would happen if I went from room to room and healed every person in that hospital, I mean, they would come after you. <clears throat> I read a book called Gross National Happiness. It's a funny book. It says conservatives are happier than liberals. 
and the author thought it would have been the other way around. Not many people really know what a musket is. This is one of them. Very, very simple looking weapon, but used from the 1720s right through to the 1830s without change. And a soldier, whether he's at Cologne or Waterloo, is using something just like this. Don't need to describe what it does, but what's interesting is how familiar people actually are with it. Because of the language that is associated with this particular weapon. Give me some ideas. It's three parts. There's a lock, the bit that sets it off. This one's the flint lock. The stock, the wooden bit, and the barrel. Hence, lock, stock, and barrel. People still use that term to this day. It's got a muzzle. Dog sound muzzles. That's the dangerous bit. Then down here as well, we've got the area called the pan. The pan takes a small charge of gunpowder, which is external to the barrel. In fact, to load it, you bite open a cartridge made from um, cartridge paper. You pour in some powder, and having half cocked the safe position, hence going off at half cock, you can close up the frizzle. When you pull the trigger, what should happen is the flint strikes the frizzle, the steel, showers sparks, ignites the external powder. Unfortunately, if that doesn't work, if there's a bit of dirt, you get what's called a flash in a pan, something that doesn't work. So a musket has been out of use now since the 1850s. And yet, in common usage, every day, people talk about flashing the pans, lock, stock, and barrel. They mention the use of cartridge paper without ever realizing that this is where it all comes from. The next thing to make stewardship a Starbucks experience. We've got to own it. The sixth Next thing, I call it lock, stock, and barrel, but let's boil that down to one word. Detail. Detail, 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 detail leads to excellence. In other words, I pastored a 400-member church, and you could see the concrete underneath the carpet. It was so thin bare. Misspellings in the bulletin. The very first church I pastored, I did the bulletin. And my, there was a uh, high school typist teacher. She would correct the bulletin for me during church and hand it to me on the way out. And I thought, something's got to stop. I don't like, you know, I don't want to do this anyway. Uh, maybe the music is too loud. The preacher shakes hands too soft. Um, I was at one church. I just had one church. It was a tough assignment. I mean tough assignment. My secretary's husband killed himself. Uh, I landed there and uh, I got a phone call. This man waited for his wife to get home. He killed her. Before she got home, he stuffed the mouths of his two little boys full and strangled them. And after he killed his wife, he killed himself. And this is back in the days of when this lady got in trouble over the dingo thing down in Australia. And I could just imagine the media descending on my church. And they did come. They wanted to film the funeral. And I said, no, you can't come in and do that. It had an impact on that congregation. The board was a mental basket case. What is amazing, psychologists have studied suicide so much that they have a three-step progression that a person who is contemplating suicide will go through that. I knew that, but I was just new in that church. And I didn't know these people but we could have saved that family. Details. So I'm in this church, the four-year ministry, and I always had an eye out for people who wanted to be part of the church. I believe that the most important time of a pastor's week is 30 minutes before church, excuse me, 30 minutes before Sabbath school and 30 minutes after church. 
If you have multiple church districts, I know that's not always possible, but that still is the most important time. 30 minutes before Sabbath school. I've, I go to churches and the preacher doesn't even show up until it's time for the sermon. I don't get it. Maybe he doesn't own it. Doesn't own the whole concept. I, I asked the conference, can I have some evangelistic money to do some evangelism? They said no. I thought, well, I guess that tells me that uh, I probably am not going to be an evangelist someday. So I developed my evangelistic foyer ministry. And I'd hunt for people. And I said to the church, I want a pastor's class right inside the sanctuary door. Because if a latecomer comes, boom, they can come right in. They're going to gravitate to the pastor because he's the big dog. That's just the way it is. Or if you're an elder, they'll come to that. Well, there's this guy, he'd come to church for years. He'd grown up in the church, very, very shy. The conversations I had with him were whispers. And I discovered, he was in his 30s, I discovered he had never been baptized. So I went up to him one Sabbath, I said, hey, would you like to be baptized next week? He said, I sure would. I said, okay, we'll plan it. And he was baptized next week. I did not whisper in the baptistry. <laughs> An eye for details. Make a conscious effort. Get organized. If you want to have an eye for details, just rearrange the furniture in your house and you'll see details. This guy, Steve Jobs, he says, innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. We do not want to sacrifice our principles and our faith, but let's be innovative. I'm not really a fan of having food before Sabbath school, but if there are people that don't have food at home, maybe we could help them. They could come get a meal. Every detail has a bottom line repercussion. Have you ever heard the phrase, don't sweat the small stuff? That is a terrible philosophy to practice. Because it breeds poor performance, wasted opportunity, mistakes, inconsistencies, oversights, and poor experience. So if we just go to church, ah, oh, it's a lazy fare, oh, everything's fine, you know, you know. Don't sweat the small stuff. Every crime scene investigator knows that it's the smallest detail that might crack the case. Athletes know that the slightest change of swing in the golf club could mean winning or losing, especially at these Olympics. I just saw a quick interview of a girl that got bronze. The last Olympics, she got gold. And she says, I was really upset at myself. I just, did ha I just had a bad run. She will play that tape over in her head for the rest of her life. Just a little detail here, little detail there. Doctors and nurses understand the slightest mistake or loss of focus can result in a tragic situation that carries massive liability. I visited a lady one time. She didn't have too much money. She said, I want you to come back. Come visit me again. So I went, and she had the big chocolate cake, and I had to suffer and eat a little piece. And, and she said, you know, I had surgery, and they left a sponge inside of me. And they settled for lots of money. And I want to give some to the church. I want to give some to Amazing Facts. I want to, and she was giving this money all away. She could not stop smiling. I guarantee you those doctors probably went through details. You know, I, I used to be heavy into jogging and I pulled muscles and uh, I took an NSAID to cut the pain in the muscle and I got a nosebleed. I was at a Lutheran church doing a finance seminar and before I could, uh, 
I was at lunch and I was going to do the seminar in the afternoon. I'd preached there that morning. And I go to, I mean, in a little town in Nebraska, and I'm in this little podunk clinic with a profuse nosebleed. I thought I was going to drown. So I spent a week in the hospital for a nosebleed. I was allergic to the inset. So they did, you got a, 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 a irregular heartbeat. And so they did a cat, heart cath on me. And they said, we're going to go through your wrist. And he didn't sterilize it. And then I got blood poisoning. And I went through all of this. I was just trying to exercise and stay healthy. But it changed their whole procedure in that hospital by not using, they, they didn't use some type of sterile bandage, but they changed to use sterile bandage. They paid attention to details. Do you guys remember a basketball player named Larry Bird? How many times do you think he would shoot the same shot into the basket on his own basketball cart, court that he built at home? How many times would he make the same shot every day? He would shoot the same shot 500 times a day. That's detail. Here's this guy. The key to quality in every aspect of our lives is doing little things correctly all the time, every time. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and and, 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 and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Those you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Everything is important. Success in this life, success in Gaining the future life depends upon a faithful, conscientious attention to the little things, and faithfulness should characterize our life in the least as well as in the greatest of its details. Be transparent. How can you be transparent? Here's one way. This is a sample of a missional budget. I showed you a line item budget yesterday. This patterns that line item budget, or uh, that line item budget. So you have church operations. So this is what you might say in an offering appeal. The church building is a place to worship that needs to be maintained and made comfortable for all meetings and events. Church operations provide the foundation for all other activities of the congregation to take place. The programming of a church will progress smoothly as operating expenses are funded. Your offering to combined budget will support the mission of church operations. And then you just give the amount. But in that amount, you may pay the secretary's salary, you may be paying the internet, you may be paying the electric bill, but you don't have to get up there and say, we gotta pay for our electric bill. If you, give, if you ask for money in a negative way, you will receive less than if you ask for it in a positive way. So take the needs and ask for it positive. <clears throat> this is local evangelism. Evangelism in the local church is when members reflect the character of Jesus. This will make an impact and lasting impression on the people touched by personal ministries, Pathfinder, Sabbath School, or you could feature a particular part of your uh, ministries in your church. Your offering to the combined budget will support ministries lifting up the banner of Christ to the lost world. And so you're just going to list one figure, which will be funding the pathfinders and the uh, primaries and juniors and, and so forth. Incidentally, there are specific words chosen here on purpose. This will make an impact and a lasting impression on people. Because people want to know that their gift is going to make an impact on the lives of somebody else. Capital campaigns. Congregations sometimes outgrow their facilities or the existing one needs remodeling. These projects use, cap use capital campaigns within a congregation to provide financial support for such unique opportunities. Your sacrificial gift will provide facilities to allow ministry in the name of Jesus. Then you list the amount you're after. Church school. This is probably the easiest area to raise money and get money for because people like to give to support children. Adventist school, church school, education is a high priority in the local congregation. Church members have the opportunity to help develop faithful members and leaders of tomorrow. Kids 
have an enthusiasm that is contagious, an energy level that is coveted, your offering to the budget will support the mission of Christian education. Point number three of a Starbucks experience is serendipity. This guy Warren Buffett coined the phrase, put skin in the game. And I like that. Whenever I return my tithe and I give offerings, I'm putting skin in the game. What did he mean by say, putting skin in the game? In the business world, if I own a company, putting skin in the game is when I take some of my personal money and put it in the operating fund of my company. I own part of that company. I've put skin in the game. But if I have a culture where people come and I want, they want spirituality without obligation, they don't want to put skin in the game. Somehow or another, uh, this is a very clever way for people to understand they need obligation. Put some skin in the game. Come on, put some, you know, instead of uh, Clifford and Goldstein going down the aisle saying, come on, guys, cough it up, cough it up. Uh, uh, for the offerings, uh, we can encourage people to put skin in the game. Do members have any skin in the game? How do we get them to do that? Surprise and delight them. That's why we have uh, these children materials. Uh, when members come to church, are they surprised and are they delighted? Uh, a number of churches I pastored, they said, we have never had the pastor open the front door of the church for us to come. I was kind of amazed. I mean, I'm out there trying to focus on those people. I had, I've actually watched people get out of the car and they're arguing, and they come, and I know, don't take anything personal, John. Just smile and welcome them to come in. One church, we bought all the deacons great big golf umbrellas. And we said, it's your job to meet the people at the door when it's, of the car when it's raining and escort them in to church. I mean, they used those umbrellas till they wore them out. And these deacons would run competitively to try to escort these people into church. Just trying to surprise people uh, out of the ordinary. Design the right experience for members. How do you design the right experience for church members? Poor execution at church will not do. Work the foyer, develop members' capabilities. The church gets better at what it does. Well, I need to move on here. When you earn serendipity, you see what others don't, do what others won't, and keep pushing when prudence says quit. How do you surprise people? I've seen this done twice. It was a church in Baltimore and then uh, out in California at our ministries convention. The church in Baltimore, I did a whole weekend there, and the stewardship director got up. She said, I have five envelopes. I would like five volunteers to come up, and I want to give you an envelope. She was also the investment leader. She said, in the envelope, there's some money. I want you to take the money and start an investment project. Come back in a year and tell us the story. Out in California, there was a man by the name of Dick Dirksen. Have you ever heard of him? Maranatha? He was stuffing envelopes when I first saw him. He was putting $50 bills in these envelopes. He said, guys, all my stewardship directors, I have 12 envelopes and there's some money in it. I want you to go partner with God and in a year from now, tell me the story. So pastor, you have some investment money. You're gonna use your offering. It's not gonna save you much tax if you use your offering one month for this type of project. Put some money in those envelopes and challenge your church to partner with God 
with an investment project and see what kind of interesting stories show up. I can remember as a kid, there were these guys using investment and they were saving money because they said, we want to see how long our razors will last. And the money we save, the longer we can use these razors and they keep shaving, they will save money and we'll give that money. Uh, and they were reporting how many shaves they got out of these razors. Um, so there's a surprise element. Jesus, he had the tact to meet the prejudiced minds and surprise them with illustrations that won their attention through the imagination he reached the heart. The go to church service or Sabbath school where you can get surprised. My VP, Deborah Brill, I have to have meetings with her from time to time. She's a very wonderful lady, a good boss. She says, John, I never know what you're going to do next. And uh, I said, well, I do that on purpose. And just uh, the other day, I was, yesterday, I was talking to my wife. She said, John, after all these years, you never cease to amaze me. I said, what do you mean by that? <laughs> she said, you're just one more surprise after another. We need to be tactful as Christ. We need to surprise and delight. We need to appeal to the heart. Jesus used birds, seed, field. Jesus also put skin in the game. He was willing to go to the cross. Skin in the game requires moving beyond just being interested in people. It means taking their interest as you own, as your own, and contributing towards something that is important to them. So this is pushing the edge. It's, but uh, sometimes there are situations in a congregation people don't agree with. 
they don't agree with your tactics or the way you appeal for tithes and offerings or many other things. Uh, we need to get feedback. Some churches, this might work. Uh, this type of dialogue goes further than most of us might go, but we do need to talk about the objections. I object to this type of offering appeal. I object to people mumbling an offering appeal. I object to mumbling sermons. But let's embrace criticism so as to improve message and ministry. Listen to this, Gospel Workers 376. If Satan can keep men answering the objections of opponents, thus hindering them from doing the most important work for the present time, his object is accomplished. So don't spend too much time on objections. The more you catch people doing things right, the more right things they will do. So here's some objections. This comes from a book, uh, Myths of Giving. Christians do not possess the discretionary financial resources to give, 10%. True or false? That's false. Christians subjectively believe they do not possess the discretionary financial resources to give. That's false. One is they don't have it. The other one is I, I don't think I have it. Christians do not perceive existing legitimate needs that their money could meet. True or false? That's false. Four, Christians lack awareness their church teaches 10%. That's false. So key to successful communication, if you're in a difficult situation where you're dealing with objections, listen, accept, commit, Explicit action, learn from objections to improve. It says, I'll walk with you every mile. And I sang that at the, in the GC auditorium, and I said to my wife, I said, you know what? When it comes to that part of the song, I'd like to do the moonwalk. <laughs> she said, don't you dare. <laughs> I mean, I was already trying to learn it, but uh, I couldn't do it and sing at the same time. <laughs> Starbucks wants the employees to leave their mark. We want to leave a mark. A church makes their mark. Michael Jackson made his mark. His mark was that moonwalk. He didn't originate it. It came from a French mime that, that actually was doing it. But he made it popular. He made it his mark. It was his signature dance move. So what is our church known for? Just like Starbucks, what are they known for? Uh, it's not often a person can pinpoint the exact moment Michael Jackson became a superstar, but for Michael Jackson, it was his performance on Motown 25, Yesterday, Today, and Forever. And that's in 1983 when he did the moonwalk. I saw something on uh, the internet this morning where the IRS says Michael Jackson's estate owed $700 million in taxes. And uh, so they're, I mean, they said he's still in the limelight even after his death. Um, so that is his legacy. Leave a legacy, leave your mark, be involved in your community, have good social values. How do you have your legacy and how do you make your mark? Put your Family first, your career second, church third. Own it, details, constructive criticism, and make your mark. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world give. Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That 
is the legacy Jesus gave. If we could get people to leave church sensing that they have peace with God, there will be no problem with the money. It doesn't mean we don't educate. It doesn't mean we don't train. It doesn't mean we don't appeal. But it means we have to reach the heart. From coffee to caffeine kingdom, Starbucks proves relationships are as important as our physical assets. You and I live in a culture that the experience is more important than the content that is given. It's absurd. So we've got to make the content an experience that reaches the heart. A legacy compromised with the standards of the world. Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Legacy, apathy toward its mission in the world. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. God help us not to veil the gospel of Jesus to people who are dying and will never inherit eternal life. What kind of legacy are we gonna leave? Abraham Lincoln at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C declared more days of prayer and fasting and thanksgiving than any present before or since or since. He questioned the Bible until 1862 in the devastating civil war. His son Willie died. His wife turned to spiritism. Finally, Lincoln embraced Christ and here's what he said, my own wisdom seemed insufficient. I was driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I have Nowhere else to go. And those last few words have always stuck with me. I have nowhere else to go but to Jesus. Amen. Our congregations have nowhere else to go but to Jesus. Amen. In a culture that hates what we're doing. In a culture that is succeeding in blurring people's spiritual eyesight. That's captivating their imagination with materialism. It's like fighting an uphill battle. It's like trying to put out a fire with a squirt gun. And Jesus says, huh, I know all about it. Here's my legacy. It's peace. Amen.